So now that we've had a chance to kind of talk about populations and how they interact with each other a little bit, we're going to move on to community. So community ecology is basically the study of communities, which are just groups of populations. And we've already seen a little bit on how those populations might interact, but this chapter is really all about uh, the nitty gritty details of how they might interact. And so just a reminder that as we kind of zoom from the smallest unit, which is just an individual, we go outside a little bit, that's the population. Then we zoom out some more, that's the community. So that's where we're looking right now. So a community is just a bunch of populations. Okay? And so if I showed you an image like this, you should be able to recognize that this is a community because there are clearly different species here. Okay? Um, and so it's not just going to be what you can see, it's also going to be any kind of microscopic organisms, which will generally be relevant as well. Um, but when we talk about communities, because we can't just talk about how many individuals there are anymore, now we have to talk about multiple species. And so we have two major terms that we need to be able to or to uh, describe, rather, and that's species composition and species diversity. So species composition is the total number of species within a community. So like if there were four different species, that is my composition. Okay? And so in this uh, top community, we can see that there are four different types of trees. Uh, and so I've circled them here. There are four different types of trees. Okay? So my species composition is four because I can see that there are four unique trees. Okay? My species diversity, however, is not only a pure number, but it also takes into account the abundance of a given species. So some species will be present in a lot higher of numbers than others. So community two down here is kind of showing you an example of that. So if I were to basically circle all of the individuals who were the same as uh, species A, so all individuals who were species A, that would be 80% of this community. Okay? Whereas in community one that we saw up top, it's evenly distributed. Okay? And so community two has less of species B, C, and D. And so we need to start thinking about how this species might be considered less, or excuse me, this community might be considered less diverse because it is mostly one species and just a little bit of others. Uh, and so we're going to see this kind of thing all the time. We're going to do some activities in class where we get to calculate how diverse is this community um, because there is an equation that you do need to be able to use. You don't need to memorize it because it will be on your formula sheet. So we'll get there soon. Um, but basically we're trying to figure out how species are interacting with another one another and how that interaction might be influenced by their environment. Okay? And so the community is all the living parts, all right? So it's like, uh, the bird species and all the tree species and all those things that are interacting. And there are abiotic parts too. There are non-living parts. But for now, we're kind of focusing just on the biotic parts because we don't really talk about abiotic parts until we get to ecosystems, which is the next kind of, you know, zoom out. It's the next level up. So <clears throat> we'll see a lot of ways to represent population uh, interactions. So like here, you might see something like this, which is a moose to wolf ratio, meaning that if you are higher up, like over here, for instance, around 1990 or so, uh, you have more moose per wolf. Okay. Whereas if you are lower, you have fewer moose per wolf. Now you still have more moose than wolves. It's still a ratio of 25 to one, even when it's low, right? But it's much smaller than way up here when it's around 150. And so this is just one way that we are going to illustrate different population dynamics, how they change. You might also see just two different population lines, uh, just population graphs. So here I have a hare and a lynx population. This is kind of a classic case study that you probably saw in uh, uh, excuse me, middle school or something. But basically, as you can see, when the hare population goes up, it is typically followed by the lynx population go up because the lynx will feed on the hares. And then that causes them to kind of dip down because now there's fewer of them because they're all getting eaten. And oh no, now there's not enough food. Now the lynx will go down, etc. So there's just ways that we can represent these different populations interacting. And this is just another one of those ways. Uh, and so this kind of begs the question, well, what happens if we 
introduce a species to a community where it was not present before. And so that's going to be what we call an invasive species. And we're, we don't get the opportunity to explore this too, too much, unfortunately. But uh, an invasive species is when something gets into a community where it doesn't necessarily, quote unquote, belong. Right. And it's kind of hard to establish, well, what do you mean by belong? Well, it's not native there is what we would say. Okay. And so here we have basically a graph of an invasive species. And you'll notice that this is just the S curve. This is the logistic growth model, right? Because when something gets introduced, it generally gets introduced in small numbers. Okay? And then they'll start to reproduce. And then maybe some people are going to start taking notice. That's what this early recognition is saying. Some people are going to start taking notices, notice at this point. They're going to start spreading out a little bit. Uh, and then Right here, we're going to really start to see it ramp up in size. And then public awareness typically only really takes place right here. So the species is already pretty established at that point. Uh, and then we are starting to near the carrying capacity. So it's really important that we pay attention as best we can, because if we don't catch these things early, it will be a harder thing to treat. And we'll talk about kind of why. This is a throwback to uh, the previous lecture where I talked about competitive exclusion. Just something to remember that if you in introduce a new species to a new to an area, uh, then they are going to really disrupt the conditions for the species that are already there in one way or another. So <clears throat> now we've kind of talked about what communities are, and that they have different diversity. So there's a way to calculate that diversity. And so that's going to be called the Simpsons Diversity Index. Okay? And basically what the Simpsons Diversity Index is trying to do is it's trying to put a number to how diverse an ecosystem or a community is. It's trying to find a way to compare communities and say, oh, community A is more diverse than community B. And so in order to do that, there were two things that had to be defined, and those are evenness and richness. So evenness is basically a measure of the relative abundance of the species. So like, are there the same number of species A as there are of B, right? So this is like in that community one you saw a few slides back. Uh, that was a very even ratio. There was 25% A, 25% B, 25% C, 25% D. Okay. Whereas in the community two, the evenness was what much, much lower because species A dominated the entire thing, right? And so when you have a high evenness, when it's all really nice and even, then the value for the uh, Simpsons diversity index is going to be larger. And so we're going to see what that looks like. Uh, but richness is a way for us to measure variety. So this is basically just how many species are there. So this is akin to way back here when we were talking about the species composition. So species diversity is kind of getting at the evenness and the species composition is kind of getting at the... Sorry, I'm trying to flip through here. The richness. Okay. So there are going to be a lot of different environments that you need to be comfortable analyzing, right? Just at a basic level. But for instance, if we have something like a temperate rainforest, rainforests have really, really high richness, which means that there are a ton. Remember that richness is the number of species. So there are a ton of different species here. Now, there might be a lot of one species, but we can look around and we can see a bunch of different kinds. Whereas if you look somewhere like a, a monoculture uh, agriculture area or a forest, often you're going to have very low richness. It's just the same thing over and over and over again. Okay. And so you can just visually see the differences here, right? You can see that there's a lot of species here. There's not so much diversity here. And so in order to calculate this diversity, we use this comp this uh, equation that seems really complicated, but it's really not so bad. Uh, so you basically take one minus the sum of N over big N. Okay? And so we're going to talk about what that is squared. Okay, so we have to do that multiple times. So little n is the total number of organisms of any species, whereas big N is the total number of organisms of all species. So if we were to go over here to these original images and we had to find big N for community two, 
just get rid of some of that. If we had to calculate big N, so that's the total number of individuals, you literally just have to count them up. So like one, two, three, four, five, et cetera, right? Um, so you would just have to count them up. And so there should be 20, right? But then we would want to count, calculate the little n for each individual species. So we would have to be like, okay, little n of species A. Okay, well, if I were to count up all of A, how many would I have? Well, now that I know how many there are total, then I know 80% of 20 is 16. So there's 16 little a's, or excuse me, uh, species A, okay? The n of B is going to be one out of 20, okay? And then n of C is one, and n of D is two, okay? And so all we would have to do is basically take these numbers that I've just calculated here and apply them to that equation for Simpson's diversity index. And this is actually a screen cap of part of the AP Bio formula sheet as of 2020. So uh, you do not need to memorize this uh, equation. It will be provided to you, but you do need to know how to use it. And so we're going to practice that a lot in class. But basically, we just plug in the little ends and then the big ends for each, and we square it, and we subtract it all from one. Okay? And so if you have a high value of that D, so that's like your diversity, okay? that's what you're calculating here. If you have a high value, then that's going to be a really stable, complex ecosystem. Okay? More biodiversity means that the ecosystem is healthier, because if something came around and wiped out all of species A, well, now species B, C, and D can repopulate if there are species B, C, and D. But if there aren't, then there's nothing there to replace it, right? Whereas a low value of D would suggest quite a few different things, but mainly there's just less diversity. So it could be that humans have caused that. It could be that there have been some kind of uh, disturbance like pollution, again, human caused, um, or deforestation. It's not always going to be human caused, but that's going to be what we see most of the time nowadays. And so you can actually compare the Simpsons diversity index for different areas. You can look at the tropical rainforest where you have a lot of diversity. And then if you look at some more extreme environments like a desert, you can see that very few things can survive here. So they're going to have a lower diversity rating. Um, and so if we were to go through and actually calculate all of these things, it would be a really uh, difficult and arduous process. So it's not anything you need to be able to do to this degree. But just know that there are calculations for different areas. So like if you look at different elevations of the same mountain, for instance, you have vastly different diversity ratios. And so that's a really big deal and something that is a really active form of research right now. Um, and so if you're interested in some more community ecology practice, here's some extra videos I recommend. But I'm going to start talking about ecosystems. So ecosystems are basically the same thing as communities, except we add in the abiotic factor. So we add in the carbon, we add in oxygen, we add in basically everything else. Okay? And so these are going to include temperature, light, any kind of abiotic factor you can think of. Okay? And within ecosystems, it's important not to lose track of those interspecific interactions, so different species interacting, right? We're, we're st we still have the community there. Uh, we're just now also incorporating all of the matter, so like all of the carbon, all of the nitrogen, et cetera, and the environment and the environmental conditions. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And so when we talk about ecosystems, we really have to track energy flow. Uh, ev the source of almost every ecosystem's energy is the sun. Okay, and that sun gets fed to producers, right? Fed of obviously is not being used um, from an eating perspective, right? It gets sent to over to the producers, and then the producers use that energy to build their bodies. And they need something else. They actually need some nutrients, right? And they're going to get those nutrients from the soil generally, if we're talking about like a land situation, right? And they're going to let off some heat. So we do have some energy leaving from the producers, because anytime you do any kind of process like this, any chemical reaction, you're going to lose some energy to heat. Those producers might get eaten by consumers, so the energy is now going to the consumers, or it could go straight to the decomposers, right? So plants die and they have to get decomposed, but consumers die too. And so ultimately it's this big old cycle. It starts with the sun and then it gets 
sent through producers, consumers, and decomposers. And then those things get broken down and they refill the nutrient pool. So they break down all those nutrients and then those are able to be used for the next producers, right? And so this is something that's fairly basic to you now because we've seen this a million times, but we can actually quantify this and we can actually calculate how productive certain areas of the world are. So we can actually calculate the primary productivity of an ecosystem, which is basically how quickly can photosynthesis, photosynthetic organisms in that ecosystem do their job? How quickly can they produce? So like produce oxygen, for instance. And so we can figure out basically where are the areas of the world where the most carbon is getting taken in and put into plant matter. And so that's actually a really big deal. And it's actually really useful, especially right now when we're worried about stuff like global climate change. And so energy will basically go through one of these food chains. These are the same food chains you've seen a million times over, so we're not going to spend too much time with them. One thing that I will say is that the arrows always have to show the flow of energy. So it might be really tempting to go like, oh, the fox eats the bunny, so I'm going to draw an arrow. But no, don't do that because the energy is going from the bunny to the fox. So the uh, arrows are tracking energy if this is a food chain or a food web. Uh, and so if we do a bunch of food chains together, and it's, this is a more realistic view, we create that food web that you guys have seen a million times. And it's basically just how do those food chains interact, uh, what eats what, and it's it's more holistic because not everything is um, you know as straightforward. A lot of organisms will eat a lot of different things, and sometimes they'll eat like over here. The lion might eat the bunny or the fox, you know, if this was a slightly different system. And so a food web is just more realistic. And then. We also will start to see energy pyramids. So these are basically how much energy is available at each level. So if there's a million joules of sunlight, so that's that bottom layer of the pyramid here, okay, a million joules of sunlight are coming in to this ecosystem, 10,000 joules will be made available to plants, 1,000 joules will be made available to the primary consumers. So we go from primary producers to primary consumers. Uh, and then we go from primary consumers to secondary consumers. So these are the consumers that consume the primary consumers. Uh, and we only have 100 joules left. Tertiary consumers, they eat the secondary consumers. Now we only have 10 joules. So we create these energy pyramids in order to show that the amount of energy that you have as you go up in a, in, in a trophic cascade or trophic uh, pyramid um, is going to decrease by a significant amount. You basically only have 10% of the energy left. Uh, and so that's not what's happening with the sunlight. So like this has a bigger gap. That's why they're not connected here. Uh, so you don't need to worry about that. That's just because of the inefficiencies of plants. Okay. But if we go from primary producers to primary consumers, we only have 10% left. Okay. And then as we go each level, we get 10%. And so that means that a hawk has to eat a lot of these little mice in order to get the necessary amount of energy. Because even if they eat 100 joules worth, they're only going to really get 10 joules worth. Okay? And that's just basically because when you eat something, you have to break it down. And breaking stuff down requires energy, right? And it produces more energy, but it did require a little energy, but also... There, it's inefficient. Anytime you change energy's forms, you're going to lose some due to heat. Okay? And so when we start to think about populations, it's always important not to forget, or excuse me, when we start to think about ecosystems, it's always important not to forget the logistic model of populations because every single one of those species within an ecosystem or a community is also showing this kind of a growth, this logistic growth. Uh, and so it really can intensify the life of these organisms when there's competition, right? So if we have interspecific competition in a community, now maybe the individuals aren't going to be doing so hot, right? And so humans obviously have a huge impact on ecosystems. We could do an entire course on human impacts of ecosystems, um, but unfortunately we're just not able to. So instead, what we have really been able to discern is that 
we are really, really good at destroying habitats. So that's the biggest thing. We are really, really good at destroying or altering habitats, but we also reduce population numbers. We, you know, eat organisms, we hunt organisms. Uh, often, if they're like a, a big uh, predator, we feel threatened by them. And so we will wipe them out. Um, and I'm not just saying in today's society, I'm talking about for the last, you know, hundreds of years, this has happened. Um, and so sometimes we even wipe them out to the point of extinction. And so I don't want you to like think, oh, okay, that means all humans are bad. I just want you to think about how humans have affected the diversity. So if we did that Simpsons diversity index calculation now versus, you know, a thousand years ago, things would look very, very different. Um, and so when it comes to getting energy for an ecosystem, there's a lot of diversity here. Um, and I'm not going to spend too, too much time um, going into specific examples, but there's so much here. There's a lot of really cool, interesting adaptations for how organisms get their nutrients and get their energy. So uh, I would definitely recommend that you check those out at some point, but I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about ecosystem stability. So basically, as a general rule of state uh, of thumb, if an ecosystem has a high diversity, then it will be more stable. So if there's lots of different species around, it's a more stable system. Okay. And so if you have fewer parts, so like you only have three species, for instance, you're going to be less resilient. You're, you're going to have a harder time surviving. And we can see this time and time again. Okay. Um, but there are some really, really famous examples uh, and a lot of examples that have affected a lot of people. So populations of monocrops, so monocrops are basically like you grow a big old field with just one crop, right? Um, they will generally lack genetic diversity because they either came from similar lineages or also just they are the same species. So if something were to come along that could target this species, like a disease or a parasite or a predator or something, then they would be able to entirely wipe out this species, this ecosystem because that ecosystem consists of pretty much one species. And so this kind of takes us back to that idea of a keystone species. So if you take out a keystone species, other species will suffer and the ecosystem will collapse. Uh, so it's very, very important that if you have an ecosystem and you want to maintain that ecosystem, you worry about the keystone species, which is going to be different depending. Sometimes it's a large predator, sometimes it's something like cattle. Okay. And if you get rid of that thing, everybody suffers and the whole thing collapses. But also you need to make sure that you have a lot of other things, because if you only had cattle, you only had the predator, it wouldn't last either. So it's all about balance. And so one of the most famous examples is that in kelp forests, uh, sea otters were hunted for a long time for their pelts. And so what they do in the wild is actually they eat sea urchins and the sea urchins eat the kelp. So it, we have our little food chain here of kelp, right, which gets eaten by sea urchin. Notice that my arrows are going from prey to predator because it's showing energy. Okay, here's my fantastic drawing of a sea urchin. And then those get eaten by sea otters, which I am just going to draw as a big old blob and a little face because I don't want to subject you to my drawings. Okay, uh, give it some eyes. There we go. So <clears throat> if you take out the sea otter, who's going to do well? Well, that would be this guy right here. The sea urchins are going to go up in size. And so if the sea urchins go up, what's going to happen to their prey, the sea kelp? They're not going to have a good time. Those numbers are going to go down. And so when they started to, when humans started to wipe out sea otters, we actually saw huge declines in kelp forests. And kelp forests are really, really important. So because we took this guy out, this otter, and the rest fell apart, we call the otter our keystone species. Okay. Um, and it really depends on the environment. Sometimes your keystone species isn't as adorable as an otter. It could be a mollusk. Uh, so mollusks will actually improve water quality and also how clear it is, its clarity. But also they're really important for cycling nutrients. They move stuff around in there. Uh, and so if you disrupt these balances with an uh, invasive species, you're going to cause a lot of problems for an ecosystem. And so there are so many examples of this happening in the wild. 
uh, and I hope to show you this top video, um, or I hope, really hope to show you both of these in class, but how wolves change rivers and how some animals can be more important, quote unquote, or more equal than others. Uh, some species are more important to an ecosystem, right? So those would be like our keystone species. But you really need, remember that you will always need diversity in an ecosystem for it to last. Because if you don't have that diversity, it will decline. 